thank you very much, Elder Mitchell. And I certainly want to greet uh, Elder Mitchell, who is the prophet, shepherd, preacher, teacher, leader, feeder, elder, bishop, minister, servant of this great church, the Grand Valley Gospel Temple. Yes. And I want to greet his lovely and precious wife, Sister Eileen Mitchell, that I've been knowing for almost as long as I've been knowing her husband and the Grand Valley family. And I do want to say that it really is a pleasure to meet the Honorable Bishop Hugh Tubbs and his beautiful wife and precious daughter. And I did truly enjoy their singing. I've been looking forward to coming to uh, this meeting for quite some time. I was in Minneapolis on last week. I was guest lecturer at the University of Minnesota, and I also was preaching in a church at night. And the night the church I was preaching in, it seems like things started to happen Sunday night, and they said, well, you ought to stay next week. I said, no, I got to go see Mitch. So I said, I got to go see Mitch. I, t I told uh, Elder Mitchell, I said, listen, man, I said, whenever you crack the whip, Brother Johnny James will make the trip. So Come on. I'm glad to be here, and I'm going to share with you from the Word of God. I do want to say how I've been uh, blessed through Bishop Tubbs. I preached here, I don't know when that was, I was over Elder, Elder Adney's. I was there for his Christian education conference, and... Uh, Elder Mitchell came and got me, and he brought me out here, and I worshiped with you one night, and I preached the maddest that God has ever been. I had forgotten all about that, and that tape got around by Bishop Tubbs, and I was preaching in Akron, Ohio, and I walked into church, and the church was full of white people, and so I said to the brother I was preaching for, I didn't know you had a mostly white congregation. He said, Johnny, I don't know who these white folks are. <laughs> but through that tape from Bishop Tubbs, they had found out where I was preaching, and they came out every night. And, yeah. and I mean, and not only did they come out every night, but they dropped down some pictures of dead presidents printed on green paper. And through that, I was, I was, I was, I was really blessed while I was in Akron, and I never would have thought of all of that. I was just coming out here to be with my friend. And say something to encourage you about the Lord. But who would have thought that the Lord would have took something that simple and made it so precious? So I'm just glad to meet Bishop Tubbs. I feel like I've been knowing him all the time. And I really enjoyed the, the family singing. They, really, they got some beautiful harmony. They sing, they sing real good. You know, all of my myths have been demythologized. But the last one of my myths that was demythologized happened about, oh, six years ago. And that was the myth that I had. I said white folks couldn't sing. And ever since I said that, I've been I've been meeting some of the singingest white folks on the planet. And so all of my, I used to say white folks couldn't cook till I met Sister Mitchell and ate some of her fried chicken. She knocked that myth out. So the myths have to go by the wayside. Come on, come on. Job nineteen twenty five. Job 19.25, the Song of Solomon 5, 9, and 10, and Hebrews 13.5 and 6 are the scriptures that I'm going to use for this evening. Job 19.25, the Song of Solomon 5, 9, and 10, and Hebrews 13.5 and 6. You pray for me, of course, quite cool up there in Minnesota. That's where they invented winter. And I didn't take my coat. And I underestimated the weather. I thought it would be kind of warm still, but winter there comes early and leaves late. And I got chilly a couple of nights and caught a slight cold, but the Lord's going to help me. Yes, come on. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. All right. Song of Solomon 5, 9, and 10. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? My beloved is white and ruddy, the, the chiefest among ten thousand. In Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, and you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. 
And I will not fear what men shall do unto me. Now on tonight, I want to share with you a question that was presented to me. I was, uh, my, my wife had just dropped me off at the airport. I was going to Denver to be in a conference and going through the airport, I heard a voice say, Johnny James, Johnny James. And I recognized that voice because I hadn't heard the voice in about 38 years, but I recognized the voice as a girl I went to school with who was a cheerleader, one of the prettiest girls in the high school. I mean, she was one of them cute little things built like a Coca-Cola bottle. And the voice was still in my mind. I turned around, and there was this woman with the same voice, but taking up so much space. And not looking quite the same. But I recognized her as one of my schoolmates, and... We had a reunion in the airport, and she said, well, Johnny, what are you doing nowadays? And I informed her that I was a full-time employee of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I was on my way to give a series of lectures about Jesus. And she said, oh, Johnny, she said, I have a daughter in Denver, and I surely wish that when you get to Denver, you would, my daughter's going through a crisis. I wish you would call up my daughter and try to encourage her. And maybe talk to her about the Lord because she has really gotten radical. I said, I'll be glad to talk to your daughter. I said, give me your daughter's phone number. And I gave the lady the brochure of the meeting I was going to. And I told her, I said, why don't you call your daughter up, tell her I'm going to be in town, tell her where the hotel is, and tell her to come down to the meeting. And I got on the plane, forgot all about the woman. And on the second day in my first lecture, this very attractive, about 26 or 7 year old black woman walked in and she sat in the back of the lecture hall. And the Holy Spirit let me know this was the woman's daughter that I went to school with. Right. And I could tell that this young woman was, she was very antagonistic about everything that I said. All right. And after I had completed my lecture, she came down to the front. And she introduced herself, and she told me who she was, that the Holy Spirit has already told me that. And she, she said, I just want to tell you that the only reason I came down here is because I respect my mama, and my mama asked me to come. Right. She said, I am not into the Bible. I'm not into this Christianity, all this Jesus and God junk. I only came to respect my mama. Right. And she said, as a matter of fact, I'm an atheist. I don't even believe in God. And she went on and on and on and on. And I said to her, I said, sweetheart, but your only problem is you need to receive Jesus. Come on. And she said to me, I was born a Baptist. And I left the Baptist church and went to the Methodist church. Left the Methodist church, went to the church of God in Christ. Left the church of God in Christ, became a Jehovah Witness. Left the Jehovah Witnesses, became a black Muslim. And she said, no, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in nobody's religion. But I said, sweetheart, you just need to receive Jesus. I said, the Bible said in St. John 1 and 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And she said, why should I receive Jesus? She said, I'm six months pregnant. I met this fellow, fell in love with him. He said he loved me and wanted to marry me and live with me for the rest of my life. I submitted to him sexually. He enjoyed the pleasures of my body. Now I'm pregnant. And he's gone. I can't find him nowhere. Why should I receive Jesus? I said, but the Bible says in Colossians 2 and 6, 6, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. She said, why should I receive Jesus when I had to drop out of school? I'm not going to be able to get my master's. I don't have no insurance. I'm going to have a baby. I have to give up my apartment, give up my car, and move in with relatives. But I said in St. John 20, the chapter, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I said, you need to receive Jesus. She kept on giving me reasons why she should not receive Jesus. And I kept on giving her scriptures on why she should receive Jesus. And finally, she woke up to the fact that I had way more scriptures 
of why she should receive Jesus, then she had reasons why she should not receive Jesus. And finally, in all of her frustration, she just broke down and blurted out these words. And this is my subject for this evening. She said, what do you have when you have Jesus? My God, what a question. What do you have when you have Jesus? I gave her my ballpoint pen, and I gave her a legal pad. I said, sit down, baby, and start writing right now. I'm going to tell you what you have when you have Jesus. And immediately, I took her to Job 19.25. I said, look, I said, when you have Jesus, I said, the Bible says, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. I said, when you have Jesus, I said, you got a Redeemer. I said, let me explain to you now. When you have a Redeemer, the Redeemer must qualify on three points. Number one, the Redeemer must be somebody that is big enough, bad enough, rough enough, tough enough, and got stuff enough to beat up on all of your enemies. Number two, the Redeemer must be somebody that is able to pay the price to buy you back out of sin. And number three, the Redeemer must be a close relative. And I said, when you have Jesus, you have a Redeemer. I said, write down number one, and under number one, the letter A, put, first of all, when you have Jesus as a Redeemer, you got a close relative. I said, in Ephesians 4 and 6, Jesus is your father. In Galatians 4, 19, Jesus is your mother. Proverbs 7, 3 and 4, Jesus is your sister. Hebrews 2, 11, Jesus is your brother. And Leviticus 25, 49, Jesus is your uncle and Jesus is your cousin. Can you dig it? Uncle Jesus and cousin Jesus. Let me, let me run that uncle and cousin by you. The Bible said that in the kinsman redemption, a man's uncle could redeem him. Said if his uncle couldn't do it, his uncle's son could do it. Now, who is your uncle's son? That's your first cousin. Jesus went to the cross, fulfilled the kinsman redemption, and became, in Bible typology, your uncle and your cousin. So he's your father, mother, sister, brother, uncle, and cousin. In Ephesians 4.11, Jesus went above all heavens, put him on the top. In Ephesians 3, in Ephesians 3, 11, he's the foundation, put him on the bottom. 1 Timothy 2 and 5, he's the mediator, put him in the middle. Revelation 1, 17, he's first and last, put him on both ends. What do you have when you have Jesus? I said, write this down. You got a father, mother, sister, brother, uncle, cousin, both ends, top, bottom, in the middle. What do you have when you have Jesus? I said, now when you have Jesus, I said you have somebody that can pay the price to buy you back out of sin. And I said, the only thing that can buy you back out of sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts 20 and 28, we are blood bought. The Bible says in Revelation 1, 4 and 5, we are blood bought. Wars. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, we are blood covered. We are blood bought, blood washed, and we are blood covered by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I said, when you have Jesus, I said, you got the blood. And it can't nothing to buy you back out of sin and redeem you but the blood. Y'all, y'all ever sing them blood songs? Just a minute, don't them blood songs sound good? Don't them blood songs make you feel good? I remember... I got this traffic ticket, you know, and I hid it in my wife's glove compartment. And when I hid this traffic ticket in my wife's glove compartment, she picked me up at the airport coming in one time and said, you're supposed to be a preacher and broke the law. See, around my house, anything I, don't, anything I do they don't like, I'm supposed to be a preacher. I told my grandkids, I'm going to take y'all to Wendy's, and didn't take them. Grandfather, you promised to take us to Wendy's, and you're supposed to be a preacher. 
I hid that ticket in my wife's glove compartment. My wife pulled the ticket out and said, you're supposed to be a preacher and broke the law. I said, what law? And she said, the speed limit where you was doing 47 is 30. I said, well, I didn't break the law then. If I would have broke it, it wouldn't be 30 no more. I would have broke it to 47. It's still 30, so I didn't break it. But I said, Mama, look, you don't break the law. Nobody ever broke the law. They said if you jump off the top of a building, you break the law of gravity. You break your neck. The law of gravity is going to still be that which goes up must come down. You can, you can smoke them no-name cigarettes. You can lay out and drink wine and get high as the cost of living. You ain't going to break the laws of health. You'll violate the laws of health and break your own health, and we will bury you. I said, but mama, don't worry. But I'm going to court to beat this ticket. I said, I can beat this ticket. There ain't nothing to it but to do it. With the court, they called the case State of Michigan, County of Oakland versus Johnny James for doing 47 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour speed zone. How do you plead? I said, I plead the blood. The blood. They They wasn't quite ready for that one. So they read the charge again. I told him I plead the blood of Jesus. The judge asked me, he said, Mr. James, would you approach the bench? I said, of course, Your Honor, I'll approach the bench. I approached the bench, and the judge said, may I have a word with you in my chambers? And the judge took me back into his chambers. He said, I want you to explain to me what do you mean when you say you plead the blood? I said, first of all, let me confess. I was speeding. I said, all saints speed. That's why when we leave home in the morning, we pray tell the Lord to take all the state troopers and either bind them or blind them. We tell the Lord the ones you don't bind, blind, and the ones you don't blind, bind. And that way, when you go by doing 75 and a 55, if he sees you and the Lord binds him, he can't chase you. And if he don't see you, he's blinded. Bind them or blind them. I said, but you know, I said, I forgot, I said, Your Honor, I, I forgot to pray that this morning. And I was feeding. I said, but 2,000 years ago, when they marched my Jesus out to a little old hill called Calvary. I said, they call it Mount Calvary. It don't qualify to be a mountain but from its geographical credentials. What makes Mount Calvary, Mount Calvary, is what happened on that hill. They assassinated my Jesus. And they gave him five mortal wounds, two in the hands, two in the feet, and one in the side. And I said, Your Honor, when the blood began to trickle down the cross, I said, the ground would not receive that blood. That blood made a U-turn. And that blood went all the way into heaven. And that blood marched into God's courtroom. And that blood got into God's courtroom. That blood forgave all of my sins, past, present, and future. And I was feeding, but my plea is the blood of Jesus. The judge says, be cool. Don't get excited. It's going to be all right. He said, is that why the Christians love the thing about the blood? I said, Your Honor, I'm a Christian Pentecostal apostolic fundamentalist. By Christian, I mean I follow Christ. By Pentecostal, I mean I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit with the sign and the evidence of speaking in other tongues. By apostolic, I mean I've been baptized in the water in Jesus' name and believe that Jesus is God. And by fundamentalist, I mean I believe the Bible means what it says, like it says it, and can't nobody go to heaven to change it. And I said, the church I go to, whenever they sing them blood songs, I feel something go down my backbone. I said, my hands and my feet get light. And I just feel good. I said, there's something special about the blood. I said, you can't put no price tag on the blood. I said, if you was to say it was worth a thousand dollars, that's not enough. A million dollars, that's not enough. A billion dollars, that's not enough. A trillion dollars, that's not enough. A quadrillion dollars, that's not enough. 
a sextillion dollars. That's not enough. Septillion, not enough. Octillion, not enough. No million, not enough. Decillion, not enough. Undecillion, not enough. Duo decillion, not enough. Trey decillion, not enough. Quatro decillion, not enough. Quick decillion, not enough. Sex decillion, not enough. Sept decillion, not enough. Octo decillion, not enough. No vim decillion, not enough. Vision tillion, not enough. Decillion, not enough. Let's make up one. A zoodap billion, not enough. Not enough. There is not enough money to purchase one drop of the blood of Jesus. So we just call it precious blood, that's all. Precious blood. Blood so valuable and blood so precious that the blood can wash you and it can make you clean. The judge said, we can go back now. You're getting too excited. We went back into the courtroom. He called the court back in order and said, in this case of Johnny James versus the state of Michigan and the county of Oakland for going 47 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour speed zone, he said, case dismissed because of the blood. And when you have Jesus, you have somebody that can shed the blood and buy you back out of sin. I told the girl, I said, write that down. When you got Jesus, you got a close relative. When you got Jesus, you got somebody to pay the price to buy you back out of sin. And then I write this down. When you have Jesus, and write it down, write it down, don't miss none of it. When you have Jesus, you got somebody who can beat up on your major enemy, and your enemy is the devil. When it comes to what Jesus is going to do to the devil, ain't no name for it. There ain't no name for it. I looked up in my lexicons, dictionaries, all the books I got trying to find a big word for what Jesus is going to do to the devil. Couldn't find no name for it, so I made up a word then. You see, in Latin, the Latin word side is a suffix, C-I-D-E. It means to kill or to strike down. Whatever kind of word you put in front of side means how you struck him down. All right. In Genesis 4 and 8, Cain kills Abel. When a brother kills a brother, that's called threat to side. Exodus 2 and 12, Moses killed a man, hit him in the sand. When a man kills a man, that's called homicide. Exodus 8.31, God gave Moses the power in Egypt to kill the frogs, flies, and lice. When a man makes his living killing rats and roaches, we call that pesticide. 14th chapter of Judges, verse 6, Samson killed a lion. Anytime you kill a lion, a tiger, or a panther, that's called felicide. Yeah. Judges 15.15, 15, Samson killed a thousand men. Kill up a whole lot of folk, it's called genocide. First Samuel 31, 4, Saul took a sword and fell on it. When you kill your own self, it's called suicide. Second Kings 15, 25, they killed the king of Israel. When you kill a king or a governor for a president, it's called Riga side. In Matthew 2, 15, Herod was killing little baby boys. When you kill little children, it's called infanticide. But in Revelation 20 and 3, when the Lord puts the devil in the lake of fire, where he'll be tormented day and night forever and ever, it ain't no name for that one. Let's call that one devil side. And when you have Jesus, when you have Jesus, you got somebody that can commit devil side. And you got somebody that can take care of the devil. Now, this girl, she, she's supposed to be an atheist, supposed to be so tough and supposed to be so hard. I can see her getting weak already. I said, now write this down. I said, when you have Jesus, I said, you have an unconditional lover. The Song of Solomon 5, 9, and 10 says, What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women. What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou doth so charge us? And then she speaks back, talking about Jesus, and says, My beloved is white and ruddy, the cheapest among ten thousand. This is what you call 
figurative language. You know, white radicals take this verse and make Jesus a white Jesus. Then in the Song of Solomon 1 and 5 says, I am black but calmly. The black radicals take that one and make Jesus a black Jesus. Let me explain to you. Christianity is not whiteness. It is not blackness. It is Christness. <laughs> And when I said, when you have Jesus, I said, when you have Jesus, you have a lover. I said, look at you. You met a fellow and he told you you were the finest thing God ever made. I said, you should have known better than that. There are 3.7 billion women in the world. How are you going to be the finest thing that God ever made? I said, he tricked you. He told you you were so fine, you fell for it. You let him lay up between your legs and enjoy all the pe pleasures and the ecstasies of your body. And now you're six months pregnant and you can't find him nowhere. Let me say something to all the young ladies here tonight. Young ladies, keep your panties up and your dress down. Young fellas, young fellas, keep your pants zipped up. And keep your stuff in your pants unless you're in the restroom relieving yourself. Because herpes and AIDS is looking for you. And unwanted pregnancy is looking for you. If they find you, they're not going to let you go. And while I'm talking to you youngsters, stay off of drugs too. Don't mess with dope. Know Jesus Christ and worship him. I said, you should have known better than that. I said, girl, don't you know how men are? Men will line up from here to the tip of South America to go to bed with you. But ain't nobody going to be in line to pay your house, no car, no phone bill, light bill, and gas bill, and help you take care of your business. Don't fall for it. Don't let them drive you. After you gave, you submitted, and now the man is gone, and you're going to have a baby, and you don't know where he is. But the Bible says in Jeremiah 31.3, God said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. And I said, and when you have Jesus, the question is yours. What do you have when you have Jesus? I said, when you have Jesus... You have somebody who will love you forever and love you unconditionally. <clears throat> love thee with an everlasting love. In other words, you know what? We claim we ought to stop jiving. We tell our wives and our sweethearts how much we love them and the first thing go wrong. We're ready to throw the towel in. But listen... God's love is unconditional. It is unconditional, positive regard. And he loves you with an everlasting love. He'll always love you. Listen, when the Catholics have said their last mass, we still have Jesus. When the spiritualists have lit their last candle, we still have Jesus. When the Jehovah Witnesses have knocked on their last door, we still have Jesus. When the Mormons have went down their last block, we still have Jesus. When the Methodists have hummed their last hymn, we still have Jesus. When the Baptists have moaned their last prayer, we still have Jesus. When the Church of God in Christ have shouted their last shout, we still have Jesus. When the Church of Christ have argued their last debate, we still have Jesus. When the, Pres when the Presbyterians have taken their last nap, we still have Jesus. When the Charismatics have spoken their last tongue, we still have Jesus. And when you have Jesus, you got somebody who will love you unconditionally forever and ever. I said, when you have Jesus, you have somebody to love you. The love of God, the love of Jesus. Look at it. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Look how Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church in the past and gave himself for it. Love the church in the present is sanctifying and cleansing it with the washing of water by the word and love the church in the future and going to present it to himself a glorious church. Fellow, stop jiving. You have never loved no woman in the past. You didn't love her until you met her and fell in love. And you can't guarantee no love in the future. But look at God. He loves you in the past. He loves you in the present. And he loves you in the future. And when you have Jesus, you have somebody to love you unconditionally across all apprehensions and comprehensions of time. When you have Jesus, I said, you got a lover, a dependable lover. I said, write it down. When you have Jesus, you have a lover 
who will not desert you. When you have Jesus, you have a lover you can depend upon. I said, write this down. 23rd Psalm says, the Lord is my shepherd. I said, when you have Jesus, I said, you got a guide. You no, know, sometimes you need a guide. You have been lost. When you get lost, you need a guide. I've been lost, and whenever I said, look at you, I told this young lady, I said, you need a guide. Come on. You're out of school now. You need finances. Everybody that you talk to tell you something differently, and you don't know which way to turn. And you're all confused. I said, you need a guide. And when you have Jesus, you have a guide. The Bible says the Lord is my shepherd. That means the Lord is able to shepherdize you. He is able to give you guidance. I was on Walpoo Island, an Indian reservation, and I'm there rapping to the Indians. They're going to take me to the back side of the island, and I'm going to rap with them. And the Indian guide is taking me through the bushes. Come on. And he's cutting with a sickle, vines and things. Lizards cross the path. That's all right. What's a lizard? Yeah. Cottontail rabbits. What's a rabbit? Yeah, what's but when that diamond back rattled, wiggled across, I stopped dead in my tracks. I said, hold it. I said, I'm scared, and I ain't going to go another further. Come on. Come on. And I, I, he turned around and he grinned at me. And I said, man, I said, do you know the way? He turned around and he said to me in my Indian name, he said, Jajush, I don't just know the way. I am the way. But see, when you have Jesus, you got a guide that don't just know the way. He is the way. Jesus didn't tell nobody to go down to the corner and go three blocks and turn left. No, that's the way Buddha, Buddha said, that's the way. Yeah. Mohammed said, that's the way. Plato said, that's the way. Schopenhauer said, that's the way. But Jesus said, I'm the way. And when you have, I said, write it down. When you have Jesus, you got a guide. You got somebody that knows the way. And then write this one down. When you have Jesus, Philippians 4.19, it says, But my God shall supply all you need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. When you have Jesus, you got somebody that can give you everything that you need. And I said, when you become a saint, and when you become a Christian, automatically you become a Christian millionaire. Because the Bible says, my God, that's the bank, and shall supply, that's the check, all your need. That's the amount of the check according to his riches. That's the capitalistic backing in glory. That's where the bank's located. And by Christ Jesus, that's the signature on the check. And let me, let me tell you something. Whenever you get a Jesus check, you ain't got to be Magic Johnson or Isaiah Thomas or Larry Bird because it don't dribble. It ain't no rubber in a Jesus check. By Christ Jesus. When they're signed by Jesus, when the name is on there and they're signed by Jesus, it's got to be good. I said, write that down. When you have Jesus, when you have Jesus, you've got a God. You see, Jesus is my God. A lot of folks don't know who Jesus is. A fellow at the bus station who I knew, I talked to him on the way here. He said, Johnny, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Grand Valley, Michigan to preach for Elder Ansel Mitchell and the Grand Valley family. He said, Ansel Mitchell, he said, is he Jesus only? I said, no, he's Jesus everything. Because when you, when you have Jesus, you got a God. And when you have Jesus, the kind of God you have, when you have Jesus, you got to a Mr. Everything. Because <laughs> you see, in Genesis 3.15, He's the seed of the woman. Yes, and in Exodus 3.14, he is the Ayah, Asher, Ayah, the great I Am. Yes. In Leviticus 4 and 5, he is the sin offering. And in Numbers 24.17, he is the star out of Jacob and the scepter out of Israel. And in Deuteronomy 6 and 4, he is the one Lord. Joshua 5.15, he is the chaplain of the Lord's host. Judges 13.20, he is the ascended God. Ruth 4 and 7, he is the kinsman redeemer. First Samuel 7 and 12, he's your Ebenezer. Hitherto has the Lord helped us. Second Samuel 22.32, he's your God the rock. First Kings 8 and 11, he's the second night of glory in the house of God. Second Kings 2 and 11, he's God the translator. First Chronicles 17.11, he's the seed of David and Israel's king. 
second Chronicles 2 and 5, when you have Jesus, you got the greatest of all gods. Ezra 3, 11, he is the foundation of Zion. Nehemiah 2, 17, he is the wall of salvation. Esther 1 and 20, he is the hidden God revealed. Job 30, 37, 21, he's a horse paw in the valley. Psalms 23, 1, he is the Lord my shepherd. Proverbs 8, 22, he is wisdom in person. Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, he's something new from outer space. Song of Solomon 5, 9 and 10, he is the altogether lovely. Isaiah 9 and 6, he is the real Mr. Wonderful. Jeremiah 10 and 10, he is the true God. Lamentations 1 18, he is the righteous Lord. Let me tell you what you have when you have Jesus. Ezekiel 1 16, he is the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Daniel 7 13, he is the ancient of days. Hosea 2 15, he's the door of hope in the valley of Acre. Joel 2 25, he's the one going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. In the book of Amos, he is your burden bearer. Obadiah verse 3, he is the God who puts up and the God who brings down. In the Jonah 2.17, he is the resurrected Lord taking salvation to the Gentiles. In Micah 5 and 2, he is the ruler who is from everlasting. Nahum 1 and 3, he's a jealous God. Habakkuk 3 and 3, he is the Holy One. Zephaniah 3.17, he's God in the midst. Haggai 1 and 7, he is the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 13, 1, he's a fountain open in the house of David. And Malachi 4 and 2, he is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. And I said, when you have Jesus, you got the God of the whole Old Testament. What do you have when you have Jesus? Matthew said he was the king. Mark said he was a servant. Luke said he was a man, but John said he's God Almighty. Matthew told you what Jesus taught. Mark told you what Jesus wrought. Luke told you what Jesus brought. And John told you what Jesus thought. Matthew said he was the power savior. Mark said he was the powerful savior. Luke said he was the perfect savior, but John said he's a personal savior. He'll save you if you want to be saved. And when you have Jesus, in the book of Acts, you got the Holy Ghost in the church. When you have Jesus in Romans 3.24, you got you a justifier. When you have Jesus in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, he's your sanctifier. When you have Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1, he's your glorifier. When you have Jesus in Galatians 5.22, he's your purifier. When you have Jesus in Ephesians 4.11, he is your qualifier. When you have Jesus in Philippians 4.11, Jesus is your satisfier. When you have Jesus in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory, he is your pacifier. First Thessalonians 4.17, when you have Jesus in the rapture, he's going to be your magnifier. When you have Jesus in Second Thessalonians 2 and 1, he's going to be your classifier. When you have Jesus in First Timothy 2 and 5, he's your mediator. When you have Jesus in Second Timothy 2.19, he is the foundation of God that standeth sure. When you have Jesus in Titus 2.13, you got the great God. In our Savior, when you have Jesus in the book of Philemon, he is a friend to the underdog. In Hebrews 4.14, when you have Jesus, you got the great high priest. The great high priest is the fellow that gives the sacrifice. When you have Jesus, in Hebrews 9.27, you got the sacrifice that the priest give. When you have Jesus, Hebrews 13.10, the priest gives the sacrifice at the altar. When you have Jesus, you got the altar. When you have Jesus, in Hebrews 13.20, you got the God who gives the sacrifice. When you have Jesus, you got the sacrifice. You have the priest that gives the sacrifice. You have the altar where the sacrifice is given, and you have the God that receives the sacrifice. That's what you have when you have Jesus. When you have Jesus in James 5, 15, you got Dr. Jesus healing the sick. When you have Jesus in 1 Peter 1 and 12, you got the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. When you have Jesus in 2 Peter 1 and 12, you got the present truth. When you have Jesus in 1 John 4, 8, you got love. When you have Jesus in 1, 2 John, you got the truth in us. 3 John, the truth around us. When you have Jesus in the 25th verse of the book of Jude, he's the only wise God, our Savior. And when you have Jesus in Revelation 1 and 8, you got the Alpha and the Omega. And when you have Jesus, you got a God who's everything. And I, I, turned, I turned to that girl, I said, are you getting all this wrote down? 
I said, and remember now, you are the one that asked the question. I'm answering your question. The question is, what do you have when you have Jesus? My God, what a question. I said, write this down. Write this down. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 said, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I said, write it down now. When you have Jesus, you got a helper. In other words, when you have Jesus, you got somebody to help you do every godly thing you want to do. You want to get back in school. You want to get a job. You want a good husband. You want a good wife. I don't care what you want. When you have Jesus, you got somebody to help you. And Jesus is the world's greatest helper. And everybody needs a helper. And when you have Jesus, I said, you got a helper. I told the young I said, now you want to get back in school. You want to finish up your master's. And you want to get another condominium or another home. And I know you want a husband. I said, what you really need? I said, girl, you need Jesus. Now remember, she's supposed to be an atheist. But now she's crying tears as big as Kennedy half a dollar. And she's trying to write down on her legal pad. And the tears are falling all into the pad. And I, I, I gave her a, a pen. They must have been... A washable ink because her tears is making all the notes run. And you can't hardly read it. But in the meantime, I'm looking out the door at the swimming pool in the hotel, on the hotel. And I'm wondering what they're going to do when I get in the swimming pool and baptize now. <laughs> and finally, this, this, this young woman just broke down and cried. And I said, don't you want Jesus? And she said, yes. I ran up to my hotel room. I put on my swimming trunks and my jogging suit. I came back down. They changed her to some clothes, and we jumped in the swimming pool. We jumped in the swimming pool in the, sh- in the shallow end, and the Lord troubled the waters. Everybody jumped out, and I baptized her in the name of Jesus. <laughs> And I told, I told these two sisters, I said, take her into the sound room and minister to her. I ran back up to my hotel room, put my dry clothes back on. I came back down, walked in the sound room. When I walked in the sound room, there she was, laying on her back, still in her wet clothes, six months pregnant, stomach up in the chandeliers, speaking in other tongues, speaking in other tongues. <laughs> And listen, that was two years ago. And now that, that beautiful young woman, in two years, she had the baby and the Lord blessed her with medical coverage. She got back in school and she just finished up her master's. She sent me a copy of the thesis to read. Fine Christian gentleman came along, fell in love with her, and said, the Lord has blessed me with a package deal. I'll take you and the baby. <laughs> come on. Come on. Has a beautiful apartment, and her husband purchased her a, a Honda Civic, and he has a Toyota. Yeah. Everything that she lost, she got it back plus come on. when she got Jesus. So, Mike, what a question. What do you have when you have Jesus? Listen, it is an advantage to have an education. It is an advantage to know judges and lawyers downtown. It is an advantage to have money. But the biggest advantage in all of the world is the advantage of having Jesus. The Jesus, the Jesus advantage is the biggest advantage of all. And if there's anybody, if there's anybody here tonight and don't know Jesus... Let me explain it in conclusion. It's as easy as A, B, C, Do, Re, Mi, one, two, three. Yes, sir. Ain't nothing to it. No. All that the Lord asks you to do is repent. repent. And repent means just merely, simply be sorry for the wrong you've done. Don't go back and try to fix nothing. All right. A lot of people want to go back and try to fix everything. My wife's friend, her son, sneaked the car out and wrecked it. 
When the police got there, he's on his knees in the snow to my Lord, fix this car back like it was. <laughs> you can't go back and fix nothing. All that the Lord asks you to do is repent. And if you repent, you've done your job. Now I'm going to do my job. I'm going to baptize you in the name of Jesus. The water baptism in Jesus' name is the only formula in the world where you can get your sins remitted. See, a lot of people don't understand that. You can't go to John Hopkins in Baltimore, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, or Butterworth Hospital, or no medical facility, and get a doctor or a surgeon or a neurosurgeon to operate on you and get rid of your sins. Can't nothing get rid of your sins, but you repenting, and we water baptizing you in the name of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, let me explain to you. The Lord does not have a special set of rules for Oral Roberts, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Fred Price, Jimmy Swaggart, and all of those people who ignore and reject the water baptism in Jesus' name. There is no special set of rules for nobody. When the flood came, it is estimated there were about 20,000 people living on earth. How many were saved? Eight people were saved, and didn't nobody get saved by being in their own little rowboat either. They had to get into the ark. God always has a plan. The water baptism in Jesus' name is the only formula in the world where you can get forgiveness of sins. If you'll repent, we'll baptize you in Jesus' name. The water baptism in Jesus' name gives you forgiveness or remission or sending away, or the taking away, or the carrying away of your sins, and you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and that will give you the power over the sin nature. Now look at it. The water baptism in Jesus' name deals with the penalty of sin, and the Holy Ghost deals with the practice of sin. The Holy Ghost does not forgive your past sins. The Holy Ghost comes in and gives you the power in your life where you don't have to sin no more, but what you did before you got the Holy Ghost can only be taken care of by the water baptism in Jesus' name. If you want it, you can get it because we love to see you with it. She was a professional terrier. And they were tearing with the sister. They said, sister, tell her how to tarry. She got up off of her knees. said, don't tell me how to tarry. I know how to tarry. I've been tarrying 13 years. This old Christian gentleman told the sister, he said, sister, ain't nothing wrong. The sister said, brother, you haven't received the Holy Spirit. It means you don't believe. It means maybe you need a little more understanding. Or it means you're demon-possessed. She said, these are the reasons you don't receive it. The brother said, I'm not demon-possessed, and I believe, and I understand. My only problem is I can't get loose and I can't get free because this lower denture is pinching my gums. The sister said, well, brother, don't be embarrassed. Take them dentures out, lay them on the table, and lift up your hands and worship Jesus. You see, your hands are your antennas. When you pull the antenna up on the radio and the television, the antenna reaches up to pull the signal down to clear up the picture. Or your hands are your heavenly antennas. She said, lift up your hands and worship Jesus. She said, take them dentures out and lay them on the table and lift up your hands and worship Jesus. That brother took them dentures out, laid them on the table, lifted up his hands and began to worship Jesus. And listen, in less than one minute, he was speaking in other tongues. He ran around, he ran around that place like a fella in the training camp, training for the football season. It was more difficult getting him back down to earth than it was getting Armstrong back from the moon. But when they finally got him back down to earth, where he could speak in English again, the 75 year old old Christian gentleman said, now I got the Holy Ghost. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. He said, that means that I have now been born again. I've been born twice, he said, and both times with no teeth. And it is a fact that you must be born again. Didn't y'all hear, didn't y'all hear Jesus tell Nicodemus, you must be born again? Being born once is not going to work. You must be born again. And when you are born again, 
then you have Jesus. And you can't have Jesus unless you're born again. I'm not talking about hanging over hell on a spider web. No, and your head got wet with the midnight dew. And your dungeon shook and your chains fell off. And you gave the preacher your hand and the Lord your heart and touched the radio for a point of contact and fell out in the cotton field and the cool breeze blowed on your head behind the barn and you put your head up under the tub. Don't none of that junk work. You must be born again. And when you're born again, then you have Jesus. People ask me all the time. They say, Johnny, where were you born? I said, I was born in Portsmouth, Ohio, in Detroit, Michigan. They said, what kind of double talk is that? That ain't no double talk. I was born the first time in Portsmouth, Ohio. I was born again in Detroit, Michigan. You must be born again because being born once is not going to work. If you're born once, you die twice. But if you're born twice, you die once. But you must be born again. That's, that's the reason people are so afraid to die is because they don't have Jesus. When you have Jesus, you ain't got to be afraid about dying. When, have y'all seen the people who break up the funerals? You go, you, know, you go to the funeral, you got these people who are so emotional, and somebody got to fan them. Another one got to rub them. Another one got to stand there in front of them because they are so broke up, they're going to get in the casket with the dead person. That's a show. That ain't nothing but a wolf ticket. And I'll tell you how you can tell. Out at the cemetery, when they turn it over to the minister for the final service, and the minister goes in his pocket, and he pulls out a little black book, and he reads, For as much as it has pleased the Almighty God to take out of the world, brother, whoever he is, we can now commit brother, whoever he is, is body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. The undertaker sprinkles dust on the casket, and the, ga the casket starts to sink down, down, down in the ground. The one y'all been holding and patting and rubbing and consoling because they want to get in the casket with the dead person, let them go now. Let them go. And see what will they do. You know what they're going to do? They're going to eat some fried chicken and cornbread and greens with the rest of us because they know the show is over. But the one, but brother, whatever his name is, if, if what brother, whoever his name is, had Jesus, he ain't got to worry because Jesus will get in death with him. When you have Jesus, he'll ride through death with you. When you have Jesus, he'll bring you out victoriously on the other side of death. Remember this, death don't never mess with the believer. The believer messes with death. Death don't never take the believer. The believer takes death. Death don't never mess over the believer. The believer messes over death. And the believer takes death, makes death its bridge tunnel and vestibule to step through to get to Jesus on the other side. And when you have Jesus, you have somebody that can take you safely through death to the other side. Amen. Elder Mitchell, when Mother Taylor and Easter died, big funeral. I went to the funeral. The funeral was so big, the bishops could talk two minutes. The district elders could talk a minute. And the pastors could stand up and identify themselves. That meant little old Bertha James' son don't get nothing. But one of the Taylor girls saw me come in, Vivian, and she wrote a note. And she handed the note to Bishop David Ellis, who was the officiating clergyman. And the note said, we want Brother Johnny James to have unlimited remarks at Mother's funeral. The bishops got two minutes. The district elders got a, min a minute. The pastor's got an expression, and Brother James' son can talk as long as he wants to. Can you dig it? <laughs> and all, all the family was sitting over there on the left-hand side of the church, and I, I directed my, my remarks to them, and I said to all of them, I said, let me explain to you. I said, this is a beautiful bronze casket 
that you're burying your mama in. And we're going to take this beautiful bronze casket and your mama out to the cemetery and we are going to bury her. And I want all of you all to know that the worms are going to get in this casket and eat your mama up. When I, when I looked at, when I said that, they looked at me as if to say, now where did this nigga come from? Talking about, talking about the worms going to eat my mama up. Throw him out of here. I said, yeah, the worms are going to get in this casket and the worms are going to eat your mama up. And I said, and the birds are going to come and eat up the worms. And I said, the, ra- the crow is going to come eat up the birds. And the raven is going to come and eat up the crow. And I said, and the hawk is going to come and eat up the raven. And the buzzard is going to come and eat up the hawk. And the greatest of all birds, the eagle, is going to come eat the buzzard up. And the eagle is going to fly away off in the mountains somewhere, die, decompose, and disintegrate. And go on back to dust. But I got good news for you. When the horn blower blows the horn. Bishop Tubbs, they they sang about it. When the trump of God sounds. Let me inform you that the dust got to give up the eagle. And the eagle got to give up the buzzard. And the buzzard got to give up the hawk. And the hawk got to give up the raven. And the raven got to give up the crow. And the crow got to give up the bird. And the bird got to give up the worm. And the worm got to give up Mother Taylor and all the dead in Christ. And the Bible said the dead in Christ will rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And when you have Jesus, you got somebody who will go through death with you. Yeah, the Bible said the dead in Christ is going to rise first. I guess so. They six feet down, they got to get a head start. So they're going to rise first. And then when they catch up with us, we'll all be caught up together. But they got to catch up with us. Because they can't leave here without us. Because ain't nobody saved but us. Ain't nobody right but us. Ain't nobody going to heaven but us. And you can't get saved till you see us. Because ain't nobody got it but us. And we got it like the Bible says. I was at I was at Delaware State Teachers College lecturing, and now they had a, relig- a religious emphasis program. They had a, a atheist to speak, a Muslim to speak, a Jehovah Witness to speak, and a Hindu. And I'm the Christian, and each of us had three lectures. They tried to stop. I'm the Christian. They tried to stop my program after my first lecture, and they went to the dean and they told the dean that I said that. Wasn't nobody, no, they told the dean that I said that if they didn't get baptized in Jesus' name and receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that they were going to be lost. The dean called me in. I said, Dean, I didn't say no such a thing. And they came around and they witnessed. Yes, he did. He said, if we don't get baptized in Jesus' name and we don't get the Holy Ghost, he said, we're going to be lost. I said, Dean, I didn't say it. If you turn the tape on, you can find out what I said. He said, Johnny, to save all this trouble, then tell us what you said. I said, I never told nobody if they didn't get baptized in Jesus' name and get the Holy Ghost that they was going to be lost. I told them if they didn't get baptized in Jesus' name and get the Holy Ghost, they was already lost. Because they can't get saved when they see us. And he said, the dean said to me, don't be so narrow-minded. I said, I'm not being narrow-minded. I'm being single-minded. Can't nobody get saved till they see us. Because the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, as committed unto us. The word of reconciliation. Reconciliation is the method that God draws the sinner to him. The sinner's over there. God's over there. And the sinner over there will never get over there to God unless he see us because God gave us the word of reconciliation. And more than that, ain't nobody going to heaven unless they go with us. If if, If you don't get with us, forget about it. Nobody's going to heaven unless they go with us. The Bible said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, we're going to be caught up. Don't y'all know we is us? Somebody said, we ain't us. We is us. They said, we ain't us. We is us. 
126 Psalm verse 3, the Bible said, The Lord have done great things for us, whereof we are glad. He did it for us, and we got glad, so we is us, and us is glad. And if you want to go to heaven, get with us. Because us got it like the Bible said. And when you have Jesus, you're one of us. And when I say one of us, let me explain what I mean, and I'm going to be through for this evening. I'm talking about the true, definitive, apostolic church, which is the only right church on the planet Earth. And let me, let me clear this up, because there's a lot of folk that are misnomer. Apostolic is not a denomination like Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian. Apostolic is the adjectival form of the noun apostle. And it means doing things like the apostles did it. And if you don't do it like the apostles did it, I don't care what you call yourself. You're not apostolic. It ain't the name on the outside. It's the name on the inside. And all true Pentecostals are apostolic. The Church of God in Christ are not Pentecostal. The fire baptized are not Pentecostal. The Assemblies of God are not Pentecostal. Nobody is Pentecostal who rejects the water baptism in Jesus' name. Because on the day of Pentecost, not only did they receive the Holy Ghost, they were also water baptized in Jesus' name. And that makes them one of us. And when you're one of us, you did it like the Bible says. And when you're one of us, you have Jesus. And when you're one of us, you got it all. And that young woman, that young woman, her name is Judy. And she's, do, she's doing great now. The Lord has called her to the ministry. And she calls me up about every three months. And my, my, wife, my wife will give her the telephone number, like wherever I happen to be. Like if, if she were to call me now, my wife would tell her to call 616-677-5706, which is the other Mitchell's number. And then she'll talk to me. And as soon as I answer the phone, she'll say, Brother Johnny. Praise the Lord in Jesus' name. And I'll respond by saying, praise the Lord in Jesus' name. And she said, Brother Johnny, I want to ask you a question. I say, Judy, come on with your question. She said, the question is, what do you have when you have Jesus? 